All right. Welcome. I am here with a very special guest who we have been trying to get together for a long time now, Amy Berger. Let me tell you about her and we're going to talk about so much good stuff. You guys hear me talk about keto all the time. I decided to bring in an expert who knows exactly how to do keto without the crazy. So Amy, Amy Berger, MS, CNS, she's a U.S. Air Force veteran, badass. That's why we love having her on here. And certified nutrition specialist who helps people do keto without the crazy. She writes about a wide range of health and nutrition related topics, such as insulin, big topic on here, weight loss, huge topic, diabetes, Alzheimer's, thyroid function, hello, and more. She's presented internationally on those issues and is the author of The Alzheimer's Antidote, which many of you know is near and dear to my heart because my mom passed from that, as did her father. So, this space is huge. This is why we do keto, right? She wrote The Stall Slayer and co-authored End of Your Carb Confusion, written with Eric Westman, MD. She contributed to the American Nutrition Association's Ketogenic Diet Certification Curriculum and serves on the committee that writes the CNS board exam. She works with individual clients. She's the lead nutritionist for Adapter Life Academy, where she helps create course content and coaches people through implementing low carb diet safely and effectively. Miss Amy, thank you for joining me. I'm so pumped to have you on today. I am thrilled to be here. I am a huge fan of yours. And um, there's if, if there's one thing I'm almost more passionate about than keto, it's thyroid. <laughs> Nice, nice. Well, right back at you. I'm a huge fan. You do some like kick-ass YouTube videos. So everybody will we'll put her YouTube link. We'll go all, all over that at the end, but we'll put her YouTube link on there. You got to check her out. So Amy, I love the title Keto Without the Crazy because I don't know about you. I'm sure that's what inspired you to write it. I get the deer in the headlights look when I say the word keto. So I've actually stopped saying it. Like now I'm saying low carb and then I've coined the term pleto, like combining keto and paleo so people don't get freaked out by low carbing. So I don't know where you want to start. Let's just start somewhere. What's been your experience with keto and the people you work with? And just I'm just handing it over to you. Yeah, I um, I coined that motto, keto without the crazy, because when I, I've been eating this way a long time and I'm not, I, I am, I am low carb. Sometimes I'm very strict keto. Sometimes I'm just lowish carb, but I'm, I'm always some amount of carbohydrate restriction. But when, so I've been doing this for over 15 years, even close to 20. When I was new to this, Twitter didn't even exist. YouTube, Facebook, Reddit, Instagram, none of these even existed. Like there was the Atkins book and that was it. There was protein power. There was a couple of other books. There was like an old school message board. And it was so much easier to learn about how to do this because there was so much less misinformation and conflicting information. And um, I don't envy people that are that are brand new to it now, because if I was brand new, I would have no idea where to start, who to trust, what to do. So I try to be that voice of simplicity and sanity and like cutting through all the, like just here's what you need to do, here's why. And then maybe down the line, you need to bring in some bells and whistles, but just to get started, like there's like one or two core things and that's it. Yeah, and can, let's, can you define low carb versus keto? Because I think a lot of people do combine those. And, and for the purpose of our discussion, we need to kind of separate them. Yeah. So it depends on what somebody's goals are. Like, imagine that, you know, you and I talk about this all the time. Like, what are you trying to do? Um, so a ketogenic diet or keto is just a much, much stricter version of a low carb diet. So low carb is not really formally defined. It's just, you're eating a lot less carbohydrate than the average person. A ketogenic diet, a true ketogenic, you know, a lot of people say keto, they're not, they're doing more like low carb. Keto is just further carbohydrate restriction. Some people might be as low as um, 20 or 30 grams a day, which is really strict. Some might be 40 or 50. Um, some people, you probably know of people doing the carnivore diet now, which is 
as close to zero carb as you can get. So it's just a spectrum. And um, some people, depending on their sort of health situation, weight, their, their metabolic situation, some people need ultra strict keto to really feel their best. Not everybody does. Some people can just kind of go low-ish and they're fine, more like paleo. Right. Right. Exactly. And that's where I want to clarify, because I think a lot of people, and we're going to get into this topic of why people do gain weight on keto. I think too many people start a keto diet. And like you said, with all of the information that we're basically bombarded with these days, they go all in and they start eating all of the fat that is in sight. I mean, they're putting the heavy whipping cream in their coffee. They're and not even dirty keto. I was going to say they're eating the cheese and the pork rinds, but they might be getting their fat from really, really good sources like doing the ribeye and using olive oil and using coconut oil and eating avocados, but it's just too much for their body. So that's why I really wanted you to get into the keto versus low carb differentiation, because I think too many people enter a keto diet the wrong way. So I agree, but the, the, the problem is how we define keto or ketogenic, because despite what people hear all the time, keto is not necessarily a high fat diet. What it really is, is ultra, ultra low carb. Like that's what actually makes ketosis happen. Not eat, if ketosis happened just from eating fat, well, yeah, pass the butter, pass the cream, and I'll just pour that on my bread. And yep. I'll be in ketosis, but it's not the presence of lots of fat that puts you in a ketogenic state. It's the absence of the carbs. So the, the, the way that you would go about formulating a keto diet, again, depends on the goals. So let's say like a child with epilepsy. I mean, keto was originally formulated as an epilepsy diet. The, some of those kids really do need to mainline the fat. Like in order to prevent their seizures, they have to have 70, 80% fat. For the average woman trying to lose 20, 40 pounds, sometimes that works. Most of us are going to get into trouble, even, even if we keep the carbs really, really low. If we're overdoing fat, yeah, good luck losing weight, especially if you've got a thyroid problem to contend with on top of it. But um, I think part of, and I don't want to make people afraid of fat. You can definitely enjoy fat on keto, but just because you're in ketosis or just because your carbs are low doesn't mean you can eat an unlimited amount of fat and still lose weight. Right. Right. Exactly. So what, what is your take on calories in calories out? Because that's something we've been talking a lot about on the podcast this past week or two. And when it comes to the ketogenic diet, like you define, it is low carb. It's not just eat all the fat that you can possibly consume. What is your take on, on, caloric intake as well. If someone's trying to lose weight. Um, I personally hate tracking. <laughs> I hate tracking. I hate counting because it can be really crazy making. Yeah. Um, to me, one of the really nice things uh, about a keto or low carb diet is that when you do it right, you shouldn't have to count. You shouldn't have to like obsess over every little number and every percentage, you know, the way I do it, I don't do macros. I don't do any of that. Not that that can't help some people. Like it's, there may be a time and place. I hate counting calories. I hate it. And I think again, if you do a low carb or keto diet properly, you shouldn't have to, because it helps to control appetite so well that you kind of naturally decrease the amount you're eating. Mm -hmm. But then there, there are some of us who um, overeat or eat for tons of reasons besides actual hunger. So right. that's a problem. Like even if keto or low carb really controls your appetite, well, whoop de doo what do I do at 11 o'clock at night when I'm standing in the pantry and I'm not hungry, I just want to eat something. Um, so I guess, I guess the bottom line of that is I don't want people to count calories until and unless they have to, you know, just get started with keeping the carbs low. Let's make sure you're getting really good nutrition, see how that goes for a little bit. And then if you're stuck, well, maybe you're eating too much. Let's look at exactly what you're eating. Mm -hmm. No, I agree because I will have a lot of patients that because they're insulin resistant, we start them on a low carb diet, we start them on keto and 
and they will say, oh my gosh, I'm gaining weight. And then that's when I'll bring in, let's see how many calories you're actually taking in. Because if you're taking in by accident, 3000 calories, because like you said, you got into a habit, maybe they're overusing fat, which is, it, it can just disappear so easily. Like it's easy to start my day with 800 calories of heavy whipping cream in my coffee. Yeah. So that's when I'll bring in the calorie counting. So when you do see these fat stalls on a keto low carb diet, what's going on? What are the reasons for them? The, um, the and, and before I answer that, I want to say, cause I, you, you may or may not agree, but women, especially and men too, but women, especially if you're new to a low carb or keto diet, nobody could blame you for eating tons and tons of fat, because first of all, that's what you're hearing in the godforsaken internet. Oh, high fat, high fat. If you're not losing weight, eat more fat. So right. that's what you're being told. But let's say you're coming off of 10, 20, 30 years of calorie counting, counting points, and all of a sudden now you're allowed to have cream and avocado and bacon and cheese. So it's like, it's very normal, I think, and natural to go overboard, but then you have to like recalibrate. So if anyone out there has been in that place, please, there's nothing wrong with you. Like, I think it's totally normal that that happened to you. Um, so with uh, when somebody hits a stall, the first place I'm gonna look is carbs. Sometimes people are just eating a lot more carbohydrate. They're, they're eating the keto ice cream and the keto cereal. And mm -hmm. so that, that's number one. Um, and then if you combine that with number two is too much fat. Now you're basically on a high carb, high fat diet, which was what made us all sick and overweight in the first place. You're not right. actually doing a keto diet or low carb. Um, th those are the two biggest culprits. And then if if those are looking good, I'll see, is somebody taking a medication that makes them gain weight or that makes it harder to lose weight? And then I'm looking at thyroid because I, as somebody who people contact for help, like the people who come to me tend to have those metabolic problems because if, if low carb or keto was working, they wouldn't need my help. They would just be out there, you know, successful, loving life, weight falling off. Right. When they have problems, they're going to contact me. So I, I do see a lot of undiagnosed or improperly treated hypothyroidism. Oh, yeah. Well, you and me both, sister. I mean, we see <laughs> we see a lot of time. that. A lot of that. So yeah. can you talk to me about how the keto diet can actually benefit thyroid patients? So when you do have someone with a non-optimized thyroid, obviously you're encouraging them to work with somebody that knows what the hell they're doing with the thyroid and can optimize them. And then what are the benefits that you see when you start really working with them nutritionally and their thyroid? There, um, there's a lot of myths out there about keto and the keto kills your thyroid. You know, if you have low thyroid, don't do keto or low carb. We can get into that in a minute, but so keto, again, when done properly, I see Keto does not fix everybody's thyroid problems. Like sometimes you still need medicine, but for some people, um, especially this seems to be more common specifically with Hashimoto's, any type of autoimmune, keto or low carb tends to be really beneficial for that. I mean, I've seen people be able to decrease and eventually stop thyroid medicine after doing a keto or carnivore diet. Maybe it's because, I don't know, there's less inflammation or they're, they're eating more protein maybe. So they're like, their their whole hormonal, so I know you're big on protein too. Mm -hmm. Their whole hormonal situation is getting better. Um, even the fat too, maybe the combination of protein and fat. Let's say we've got some woman who thought she was doing everything right, exercising all the time, eating low fat, eating rice cakes. Well, no wonder she's got a thyroid problem. Right. Now we start feeding her real food, nutrition, she's getting her body's getting what it needs. Everything starts to come back online, so to speak. Um, but I mean, but it, it just doesn't, it doesn't work for everybody. People still even like, I'll, I'll look at their blood work and look at, you know, the glucose, the insulin, the triglycerides. This is clearly someone who's sticking to a low carb diet. This is a very healthy person and their thyroid numbers are just still in the toilet. Right. Right. Exactly. And then we just have to get the thyroid online and then everything will work beautifully together. 
because nine times out of 10 in my practice, I see insulin resistance paired up with the low thyroid function. So because the thyroid is off, it's having that effect on insulin regulation. Like you said, even if someone comes in and they're eating a beautiful, beautiful low carb diet, and it's fantastic, like they're even getting in the protein, they're doing all the things, they still have that a little bit of insulin resistance because of the thyroid. So then you fix that. Now they're, they're getting the bang for their buck for doing the low carb. They're getting rewarded for their efforts because now that insulin will start to come down because of the way that they're eating. So it's, it's almost like it just works beautifully together. And I agree with you. There's a, there's an anti-inflammatory effect, which then helps Hashimoto's because autoimmune conditions are so inflammatory to the body that when we can just calm everything down, then naturally, if we can listen, if we can lower your antibodies by a hundred, even though that's not the be all end all, and we don't just look at antibodies, it's going to help because the destruction of your thyroid slows down. Yeah. Could, could not agree more. I mean, the, the insulin and the thyroid, it, it, it is, <laughs> I don't want to oversell, but it is kind of magical when, when everything kind of comes into place. And I mean, I know from my own like everyone out there, if, if you if you're not familiar with me, I I I'm on thyroid medicine myself. I have a thyroid. Keto did not fix me, but to, when everything is optimized, I am physically and mentally and emotionally a different person. Right. It's it's like night and day how I feel when everything is good versus when it's kind of off. And um, I I don't know how deeply we want to get into this, but I just when I said there's a lot of um misinformation about low carb and keto diets and thyroid. Yeah. We do see people run into problems sometimes. Let's say like they've been on keto for a while and then they develop a thyroid problem. I don't think that's because of a low carb or keto diet by itself. I, I anyway tend to see that in people who are under eating and over exercising mm -hmm. and, and, and eating, you know, this, this much carbohydrate, like as much as I love keto, it's not appropriate for everybody, right? If you're if you're doing CrossFit 87 times a week, good luck feeling your best and having good thyroid function on like four grams of carbohydrate a day. Right. And you know, they're they're refueling with, with three ounces of chicken breast. And it's like, okay, the, the problem here isn't keto, it's that you're starving. Right. So yes. that's I, I don't think anyone needs to be like outright afraid or worried, like, well. I can't do keto or low carb because I have a thyroid problem or what if I develop one? It's not, it's not that way of eating by itself that makes that happen. Oh, I'm so happy you said that. And let's go down that hole of the different myths associated with doing keto and the thyroid, because I have seen some studies, some that, and we could, you know, studies in and of themselves, how biased are they, you know, who did it, who funded it? But I have seen some studies that show that if you are on a very low carbohydrate diet for an extended period of time, that your T3 can, can go in the tank. Now, I am pretty much identical to you. I am on thyroid medication. All my listeners know that. And, and I still practice a low carb diet because that is what works for my body. And I found that over the years that that is what works for my body. If I go off of that, I, like you said, I don't feel well. So I always come back to it, even if I do have moments of going off. But what about the naysayers that say, oh, if you do keto, it's going to drop your T3? Um, I have seen research suggesting that. I have also heard one of the world's foremost researchers on low carb diets. That's Dr. Stephen Finney, like just the man is a genius. He, he has suggested, and, and this is speculation, we don't know, but it's possible that the way that this way of eating changes your metabolism, you become more sensitive to T3. So you require less to get the same effect. That's, that's just a hypothesis. We don't know for sure. My concern, and I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of your podcast. I've heard you say this a million times. I don't care what the T3 is. I care how you feel. I don't care if your T3 decreased, if you feel perfectly well and you have no signs or symptoms of low thyroid. Right, right, <laughs> I mean, exactly. That's, to me, that's the bottom line. And I'm the same way. It's like, I know that the thyroid men and dose that I'm on, the T3 that I'm on is working 
I'm optimal. If there's ever a point in time where I slip into a weight gain, fatigued, constipated, hypothyroid state, I'll check myself and I'll see, maybe I need an increase or maybe I need to do something over here. But the bottom line is we know, and, and very tied into what you said, Amy, is High insulin will drive up reverse T3. Reverse T3 is like the bouncer outside of the cell blocking the T3 receptor, blocking the T3 medication hormone from attaching to the receptor site on the cell. So it, we can just trace it back. High carb eating drives up insulin. Insulin drives up reverse T3. Reverse T3 being high will block T3's mechanism at the cell level. So how we connect low carb dieting to lower T3 levels, I don't know. I'm sure like some researcher found it in one random study, but we have to look at the individual person and how they're responding and how they're feeling. Yeah, I think, I think it happens. I wouldn't say it's common. It's not rare though, but again, I, we don't know why it happens, but if somebody is totally asymptomatic, is that even a problem? Look, why, why is T3 decreasing a problem if somebody feels perfectly fine? Yep, it's not. You're 100% right. It is not. I, and I've had a couple of patients even in the last month or so where same thing, I'll be looking at their T3 and you go, how you feel? They're like, I'm great. I'm awesome. I've lost the weight. I've kept it off. My energy's back. And I go, okay, well then that 2.8, we're just going to set a sign right now. Because if it ain't broke, we're not going to fix it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what are the biggest misconceptions? I kind of went in reverse because I really wanted to talk about the weight loss component because that's first and foremost on so many women's minds. But what are the misconceptions that people have? Why are people looking at me like a deer in the headlights when I say the word keto and low carb? Probably because of um, what, what I and, and my, my co-author, Dr. West, will be called internet keto. There's the actual clinical safe normal, rational, low carb ketogenic diet. And then there's this, you have to have 80% fat. You have to put butter in your coffee and you have to, um, you have to fast, every, you know, for this many hours or this many days. And you have to, do, it has all these other parts or like even I'm, how do I say, I'm a little bit different than a lot of other people who specialize in this, in that food quality and purity is kind of a secondary issue to me. Buy the best you can afford. If you can't afford $9 for a, a jar of mayonnaise, that's okay. Get the best you can because what, what induces the metabolic and hormonal effects is the low carbohydrate intake. It's not because your food is organic or because your food is you know grass finished. Although that's great. I've worked on small farms. If you have the money to buy that, great. But if you don't, don't let that become an impediment. Like people think you have to be a millionaire to do keto or you have to like, it has to be your full-time job because you've got your app and your spreadsheet and your food scale. And like, it's, this is for the people that enjoy that. Cause there's like a lot of data geeks out there. They, that's fine. Do it to your heart's content, but stop scaring other people into thinking that that's what this is. And then the, the other whole separate issue is the unfortunate medical professionals scaring people out of what could literally be a life-saving way to eat. Your doctor saying, oh, this is gonna kill your kidneys. It's bad for your liver. It's bad for this. And it's, it's a shame because there's just more and more research coming out every day about how phenomenally good keto is for diabetes, PCOS, fatty liver, migraines, gout, hypertension. I wrote a book about Alzheimer's disease, like Parkinson's disease, um, skin tags, eczema, all this stuff, autoimmune stuff, I IBS, colitis, like the list is endless. And you've got doctors saying, well, oh, that's a fad. It's unsustainable. It's dangerous. And that makes my blood boil. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. And there, a lot of fear comes from the medical profession because I will have patients come to me and say, my doctor told me to not do this because X, Y, Z, it'll raise my cholesterol. It will, whatever the excuse is. But again, if you go back to the studies and I am going to bring in studies now, because when I was in school, I, I would save every 
article and every research paper on keto. And I put it in my little Mendeley folder and I could open that up and, and read off keto and Alzheimer's, keto and type two diabetes, keto and obesity, keto and ADHD, keto and autism, keto and, and not one of them said anything negative. It was all the positive effects of keto on that particular medical condition. And it's like, how do you argue with science when you're actually seeing it research, whether it's a randomized control study, whether it's a case study. I wrote a case study with a colleague of mine on a patient that we did uh, a VLCD, a very low carb diet, along with berberine. He reversed his diabetes. His A1C was a 13.9 and he was on insulin. And in six weeks, we got it to an 8.4 off insulin. In six months, we got it to a 5.4. You can't argue with that. And, and there is no other way that has that kind of result. You give somebody insulin, they don't get better. That doesn't make diabetes better. Right. There, there is no other approach that is as effective as this. Not even, not even bariatric surgery, which works for maybe six months and then, you know, wait till you start regaining. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Many of them regain. I see them too. What are your thoughts on berberine and using it with a keto diet? Do you like it? not like it. I not care. <laughs> no, I, um, I have done some, some research. I mean, not like original research, but reading the literature and stuff. I think berberine is probably one of the few supplements that really does actually seem to live up to the hype. It does seem to kind of be very effective. I just think if you're doing keto really well, you don't need the berberine, but there's, I don't think there's any harm in taking it, especially yeah, if somebody has really out of control diabetes, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with starting them off with keto and berberine, but you can, you can reverse type two diabetes without the berberine, but I think it's fine to take. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I think it's nice because it curbs carbon sugar cravings, especially when you're first starting them out. So if they are coming from that standard American diet of high carb eating, then transitioning them, it really does help with the cravings as well. And you had mentioned tracking, like all the data collecting it. What are your thoughts on using something like a keto mojo or a CGM, just something as, as simple as a CGM to track your glucose. So that I like better than tracking and weighing and measuring food. Um, because that, that sort of gives you irrefutable data. Like you can, you know, if you've got a CGM on, you'll find out what that keto granola bar is doing to your blood sugar. Um, or most of the time, I recommend against measuring ketones and unless if you have diabetes, yes, please check your blood sugar as right. especially if you're on insulin and meds, like as you would just sure. If you don't have diabetes, you can still check. Here's what I tell people. I'm not opposed to checking and measuring. I'm opposed to measuring when you don't understand how to interpret the numbers you see, because I have people freaking out about perfectly normal human physiology. You know, like maybe they have a little bit of dawn phenomenon, their blood yep. sugar is 106 in the morning and they're terrified. Or, you know, when you, when you do a, a very intense workout, your, your blood sugar is probably going to rise. That's okay. That's what your body's supposed to do. And, and people kind of don't understand that your, your glucose doesn't have to be an absolute flat line. Little, little ups and downs are normal, which we, we just don't want these huge spikes, but people, and the, the ketone numbers, I mean, I'm, I'm friends with the people who created Keto Mojo. I think it's a great product. These things can all be really useful when they're used in like a sensible way. I just see so many people using them. My ketones were only 0.4. What am I doing wrong? Or like, you know, how do I get my ketones higher? Well, why do you want higher ketones? Like, what are we trying to do here? So it's, it's a mixed bag. I think they, like any other technology, they can be really helpful, but they can also make you a little nuts. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. You can get some orthorexia by looking at the numbers. And just, it's funny that you said that it just, literally just today, I answered a question about a pa patient freaking out. I have these high glucose numbers from my CGM in the morning. And I said the very same thing. I'm like, well, could be the DOM phenomenon. Or it could just be that the CGMs in and of themselves have a margin of error. Yeah. So I wore one. I mean, you know, we do things just for shits and giggles and for our own data collection. Yeah. So I wore one for a month. The first two weeks, I was always running higher. I'm like, 
why am I yellow? Like, why am I 137, 128? Like, that's not me. And I wasn't gaining weight. I didn't feel whatever. It just, just didn't match up. Then yeah. I took a break, put the other one on. Now I'm 106, 95, 85. Oh. And I'm like, wait a minute. That, that, it doesn't make sense. It was a week difference. I lived the same way those two weeks versus these two weeks and yeah. totally different numbers. Totally different. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's a problem right there too. But I, some, again, I don't normally recommend this stuff, but I think the best use of this technology can be to troubleshoot. You know, yeah. let's say like you, you're really stuck or something's not working. Well, okay, let's, let's really get some numbers and see where we are. And then for the people that have a really hard time sticking to low carb or keto or whatever the plan is they're doing, those numbers can kind of be the reality check that that person needs. Like there's no, um, you can't deny that, you know, it's, um, so I feel like that's a good motivator for some people. Definitely. Definitely. Now you had touched on, and it's funny that you did, because one of the biggest spikes that I had was with a quote unquote keto cereal. So you had touched on all of those keto products out there. And I think it's important to mention because just like when you're going gluten-free, you don't want to just replace everything in your cabinet with the gluten-free version at the grocery store. Keto, I would even go so far to say as pretty much anything you find at your local grocery store with the word keto on it, you should probably avoid. I agree like 99%, you know, like, steak is keto, but you don't, you don't see the word keto on it. You exactly. know, a, a, right. a fatty pork chop is keto, but I, um, it's a blessing and a curse because the fact that those products exist, go to show how popular this has become. This stuff didn't exist 15 years ago, 15 years ago, you couldn't even buy riced cauliflower. Like you can, or you couldn't buy pre-made zucchini noodles. It's crazy. That's, that, that's available everywhere now. Very so, true. um, I, there are some people who can use those types of keto newfangled products and do perfectly well. But there's a lot of us who can't. And so we have to know, hey, just because that guy over there can eat the keto brownies and the keto ice cream and, and be thin and happy doesn't mean it's gonna work for me. And um, if somebody wants to use those as an occasional treat, that's fine. But yeah, just because it's keto doesn't mean it's it's gonna work for you if you have it every day. And for the, for the bingers out there, the compulsive overeaters, if you are going to polish off a whole sleeve of regular cookies, you're going to polish off the whole sleeve of keto cookies too. So, you know, it's, um, we, we just, we have to be really careful about that, that keto stuff. It, gets, it works for some people, but if, if somebody's doing keto and they're not getting where they want to go, that's some of the first stuff that should be out of the, out of the food rotation. Yes. Yes. And you're right. I mean, it's great as a crutch in the beginning. I mean, you know, but if you can control yourself, but I think too many people lean on that. And then that takes us back to something you said earlier about you're eating way more carbohydrates than you think you are. So if you're loading up on all the keto products, you're probably taking in the equivalent to a normal high carb, normal standard American diet. So <laughs> I'm just saying yeah, you probably pretty much, and, and people don't realize that's why Do Dr. Westman, you know, he's he's like one of the OGs in the keto field, a researcher from Duke University. His method has always been counting total carbs. He doesn't subtract all those sugar alcohols and the fiber. So your keto ice cream all of a sudden has 30 grams of carbohydrate for half a cup, just like the regular stuff. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I agree 1 million percent. And even when I'm guiding my patients and I give them maybe kind of a a, a ma I give them a macro to stay under. So based on their level of insulin resistance and how you know deep into low carb we have to go and where they came from and all that. But I always say total, not net. Yeah. They go, what? Not net carbs? No, not net carbs. Because if you go by net carbs, you're going to be taking in 200 grams of carbohydrates. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think if, if, if you're going to subtract carbs from anything, let it be the naturally occurring fiber in something like broccoli and zucchini and like almonds. Don't let it be the xylitol and the mannitol and the inulin or whatever, like in these other products. Right. 
Right. Exactly. So before I let you go, I want to talk about something that we didn't even discuss beforehand. So I'm going to put you on the spot name. But when I was researching keto, I found multiple studies that showed this is from a men out there that it actually increased testosterone levels by a pretty significant amount. And I want to say it was Thomas DeLauer, I'm not positive, who commented on this particular study and said, there's nothing else besides TRT and maybe a couple supplements that boost testosterone that will naturally boost a man's testosterone by this many points. It was something like, I want to say 117 points per deciliter, which, you know, taking a man from a 400 to a 517 that's that's a big that's a big jump to do naturally yeah oh i'm i'm not surprised i mean i think i know i've I, in part of my career I, I don't just see clients and stuff i do a lot of freelance writing in health and nutrition mostly about low carb insulin all that stuff and um keto is very good for erectile function Oh. Maybe because of the testosterone, but also because it's so good for cardiovascular function. You know, erectile dysfunction is a cardiovascular problem. It's a blood vessel problem. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's an insulin resistance problem because of the way that insulin damages the blood vessels. Yep. So, um, but also, yeah, and you, you know far more about this than I do, the effect of insulin on sex hormone binding globulin. So right. when you correct the insulin, of course, the testosterone level is going to get better. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's something that guys report that sometimes I, I, I work more with women. I do work with men. Sometimes but they don't talk to me about this. They'll mention to their doctor, you know, doc, like I'm just, my sex life is better. Like I didn't expect that from keto, but yeah, it's that, that is a real thing. Like that's not in some, that's not in just some guy's head. That's a real thing. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I didn't know if you had seen that study. I know you and I pretty much work mainly with women, but we do have our guys too. And whenever I see the guys come into my practice, they're always low testosterone because if they have a thyroid problem, if they're eating like shit, they're going to have low testosterone. So when yeah. we clean up both ends, literally and figuratively, we clean them up in the and, and get their thyroid working. And then we actually get their diet on track and implement a low carb diet if necessary. Yeah. Then everything starts working together beautiful symptoms. Do you, do you see a lot of guys with low thyroid? Cause I, I, for me, it's almost always women. I mean, I've seen maybe one guy with, uh, with low thyroid. I mean, I know it ha it's, it's, it's so much more rare among men, but, but I guess, cause you, you specialize more in that. So you probably see it more. It's, it's still very limited. I mean, there's only a handful of guys every year that I'll see that get hit with a low, low thyroid function okay. and, and the low testosterone comes right alongside it. Just like high insulin comes alongside low thyroid function, low testosterone comes with the guys. So that's the pattern. You know, I've, I'm fascinated by the fact that in men and women, the chronically high insulin has the opposite effect, right? In men, it lowers testosterone. In women, it raises it. And that's what PCOS is. Yep. It's so, that's so interesting to me. That is interesting. That would be a whole nother rabbit hole that so somebody's got to do a dissertation on that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We're just putting it out there because we don't have the time. So yeah. somebody else out there listening. Yeah, so somebody please look that. into that. Let us know. Let us know. Well, Amy, thank you so much for your time today. So please tell people, I already mentioned your kick ass YouTube channel, which is amazing. Thank so you. tell people where they can find you if they want to work with you or you taking new clients. My, my official website is in terrible need of an upgrade. So I'm going to point people somewhere else. Um, my second book that's all about breaking fat loss stalls is called the stall slayer. So go to stallslayer.com and there's a, there's a work with me section. If you can you book a consultation, but stallslayer.com. And then um, I'm on Twitter. That's my most active social media is probably Twitter. And my handle is to it nutrition, T U I T to it nutrition. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, YouTube is um my, my blog. So it's to it nutrition.com. My website is just really um, out of date. I need to update it desperately. That's but right. that's, that's I mean, I've been writing blogs headache. for years and years. So if people want to go back and read articles, it's there. Oh yeah. You know, some people still love to read articles. I'm more audible. So I'll, I'll go to your YouTube channel. I'll listen to, you know, I'll listen to an interview with you on a podcast, but mm -hmm. Hey, some people do still read. So we got to have those blogs out there for the readers. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And we're going to have all the, the links in the show notes. So nobody has to actually remember that and write it down. Just click the show notes. They're in there, but and can, can I just take one second? 
Yes. I just want people to know I'm, I'm writing my fourth book right now and it's all about thyroid. It's not a keto book, but you all, if you're listening to Amy Horn and the podcast, I found this fantastic woman several months ago. I don't know how I came across the thyroid fixer podcast and I listened to a few episodes and I about fell out of my chair because I thought, oh my God, somebody finally gets it. Somebody is saying exactly the right thing, exactly the truth, exactly what people need to hear. And I was like, what? So um, totally kindred spirits. It is, it is um, as, as your patients and, and so many people listening know, it's so difficult to find a professional who understands this. And so it's just so refreshing to know that you are out there and you can help people because there are so many people out there desperate for help with thyroid. And they're not, fortunately, they're not getting it from their doctors. No, they're not. Thank you so much for saying that. I did not pay her to say that. She said that on her own. No, <laughs> no thank you so much. That means a ton because I, I'm a huge fan of yours as well. Just you're out there speaking the truth like I am. So we, we kind of got the same same attitude, same vibe. So I love it. Love it. Thank you so much, Amy, for being on. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you.